Happy 4th of July, everyone! Um, so I had a baby <laughs> a month ago. <laughs> this is, uh, you can't really see her face. Yes, that is correct. Mama's instinct was right, and I had a little baby girl. She's a little grumpy right now, but I'll um, insert some pictures of like her actual face so you can see her, but you can see her very intense little brow. It's that hatchet girl brow. Um, but this is Miss Iris Elaine Feeney. As I said, she was born four weeks ago today, actually. I have not updated or filmed an update since I was like 34 weeks. So, oh God, you know, I've probably really screwed myself for not updating because there's oh. so much that I'm sure oh. that I'm going to forget. Oh, I know. She's trying to go to sleep. She just ate. <clears throat> so I think today's video I'm gonna try to do a pseudo brief synopsis of our birth story which whoo it was something else okay so I'm gonna go back so the last update I was like 34 ish 35 ish weeks at my 36 ish week appointment she was back to being breech <laughs> because of course she was. Um, so back to the chiropractor I went. And, um, you know, I think one of the contributing factors, I know you're trying to get comfy, one of the contributing factors for why she was so easily able to flip from breach to vertex to breach to vertex is because I had a ton of amniotic fluid. Um, so... When I was 37 weeks and four days, because the whole time we've been planning on a 38 week induction because of my gestational diabetes. So when I was 37 weeks and four days, it was a Monday. Um, we actually, so my sister was planning on coming in on that following day on Tuesday, but we had a feeling that if she was head down, they were probably gonna send me in to be induced on that Monday. So we changed her flight and she was able to come in on Sunday, which ended up being perfect. It was perfect. So she was there. Um, I went to my appointment. She was back to being head down, which I suspected that she was because um, I felt like I felt her flip back head down. So literally like they checked. They did um, an ultrasound. She was head down. Perfect. Um, the doctor came and checked me, checked my cervix, which was pretty terrible. I, I will say all of my cervical checks I were horribly painful because I mean I feel like no one ever talks about this it's not just like the discomfort of somebody shoving their fingers like in your vagina and then up into your cervix it's the knuckles so like to get very graphic we're checking with the like two fingers okay so they're going in and if you're early like I was my cervix was pretty high so they really <laughs> had to get up in there and it wasn't the fingers that hurt, it was these knuckles digging into my taint. <laughs> was so painful. Like I could have handled like the cervix part. It was just like those knuckles, god damn. Nobody ever talks about that. So pro tip, be prepared for that. Cause I, I didn't, never heard anyone complain about that. Anyway. Check my cervix. It was really nice and soft, but uh, wasn't all the way open. I think she could get just like a fingertip in, but she couldn't get all the way through. So she literally like stepped out of the room, called over to the hospital to make sure they had room and sent us over to start the induction, which we knew was gonna be real, real long. So I did have a birth plan um, and you know, I've known for a very long time that I was having this induction. so. Um, you know, our, my birth plan was very, or like birth preference, whatever you want to call it, was very open. You know, my most ideal was that I wanted to have a natural vaginal delivery. When I say natural, I mean unpain medicated vaginal delivery. Obviously I was going to be on medications to induce labor. Um, and I, I, I really wanted to be able to be up and moving around as much as possible to help facilitate the progress of labor. I did not want to be stuck like in bed on my back and trying to deal with pain that way because it's just excruciating. So 
sent us over. It was probably, I think we got there around 1130 um, on that Monday morning when I was 37 and four. Maybe I was 37 and five, whatever. It doesn't freaking matter. So yeah, no, it was the four. <laughs> um, so the plan was to do Cervidil, which is a cervical ripening agent. Um, Cervidil is not necessarily an induction method. It's to ripen the cervix to prepare for induction. So it's like a little strip of, it looks like paper. It's obviously not paper um, that they put up around and behind the cervix and it's meant to soften it. It stays in for 12 hours, usually about 12 hours. Now, sometimes um, Cervidil can actually kick you into active labor. Um, my experience was that I was definitely contracting. Um, they were showing up on the monitor and I could feel them just as like tightening. They were not painful at all. So that first 12 hour stent, <laughs> notice how I said first. <laughs> Um, you know, the whole time it was pretty well, most of the time it was me, Chris and my sister. My sister did end up going home that, uh, night, not her home, but came back to our apartment to sleep just because there was nothing really going on and there was no reason for her to stick around. Also as a side tip, my sister is a photographer and one of her specialties is birth photography. So she was there to also, you know, lend moral support and take pictures. So. Um, at some point, I will upload um, a slideshow of our birth. We did not do any vlogging just because like, that's not really my deal. Um, but there will be a picture slideshow that I can show you guys. D I have no idea when that will be going up. I don't even have it yet. So the first dose of Cervidil uh, came out at like sometime the next morning um maybe in the middle of the night i'd say anywhere between three and six o'clock in the morning i really can't remember um and my cervix was pretty much unchanged at that point while i had the cervidil in um i did have to be on the monitor did they let me do intermittent monitoring at that point i think with the cervidil they were letting me be off the monitor for like an hour at a time maybe um but i was definitely i was allowed to be up and moving so i was on my birth ball i was doing lots and lots and lots of things um to try to a make sure she was in a good position um but also trying to get like labor going i will also say um when i had my ultrasound that morning to confirm that she was head down I believe they told us at that appointment that she was also posterior. So looking face up, which is not the way you want a baby to be positioned. Side note. So first dose came out, my cervix was still nice and soft, but like unchanged. It wasn't really open at all, um, or at least no more than it was in the office. And again, that cervical check, knuckles. It was terrible. Um, so then they gave me some time. I was able to like shower, you know, be off the monitor for a little bit. Um, and I will say I was allowed to eat pretty much the entire time. Pretty much. I'll get there. Also, this is going to be a really long, <laughs> a long video probably. Um, so I was able to eat, continue eating, which was really, really great. Um, so I ate some breakfast, took a shower. Um, I think I got a little bit of rest too. And then they put in the next dose of Cervidil. Um, so we did Cervidil for another 10 or 12 hours. It was pretty much more of the same. Um, just like me being up and moving around and trying to rest when I could. Um, I was still contracting, but, uh, and they were semi-regular. I'd say they were every like four-ish to five-ish minutes, but they weren't painful at all. Um, so this has gotten us to 24 hours. So we're 24 hours into this. Uh, they take out the Cervidil 
and I think maybe I was like one centimeter after that second dose came out so the next plan was to do the um, mechanical dilating balloon which is similar to a Foley catheter I will insert a picture here of what it looks like um, I feel like this went in at about it was in the evening on that Tuesday. I can't remember what time. I feel like six-ish, seven-ish, although I feel like it was dark out. Whatever. Like, I told, yeah, it all is running together. But um, the purpose of that, it's a mechanical dilator, meaning so it's this little, it's like a catheter, um, like a catheter that goes on your bladder to drain your bladder. Um, but it's got a balloon at the tip and then a couple inches below, or maybe an inch or so below, a balloon. Um, they both hold about 60 to 80 milliliters of liquid. And the purpose of that is to put that into your cervix um, so that the first balloon gets inflated, it's on the inside. The second balloon gets inflated, it's on the outside. And it puts pressure on your cervix to mechanically dilate it. Of all the things that I had done to me during labor that was the worst I think yeah putting that in was excruciating um, I'm just gonna be really honest about it they had to put in a speculum which my doctor forewarned me that it was not going to be comfortable but I did not anticipate that it was going to be that uncomfortable <laughs> Um, they put in a speculum to place it, which the speculum on a good day is uncomfortable, but like when you're hugely pregnant and they're putting this thing, it was terrible when they were inflating the balloons. I mean, I was bawling. And it can be said after this, this experience, that I have a pretty high pain tolerance. I do. Most of the time when people say that, they don't, but I do. Um, and I bawled. <laughs> I absolutely bawled. It was awful. Um, so yeah, the plan again was to put that in, leave it in for about 10 or 12 hours to mechanically dilate. So get my cervix to dilate. That actually did put me into a bit of labor. Um, the pressure from having this thing in was unreal. It was awful. And like every time I contracted, and I was really, really feeling these contractions, like definitely having to work through them. It was at this point that we called in my doula, Angela, because I was just, I was really having to work through these contractions and I was still able to be up and around. It was kind of nice because since this was just like a mechanical dilator, it was not medication. I didn't have to be on the monitor, um, even as much as I was for the Cervidome. So that was nice. I was able to be off the monitor and free a little bit more. I can't remember how long. I think they let me be off it for an hour or two at a time. And then they would put me back on it for 20 minutes to get a strip, make sure that, you know, baby looked good, which she did. She looked great. Um, but it was not fun. <laughs> it was not fun. It made me feel like I had to poop. It was... <laughs> It was horrible. Mm. Um, so that was in for about 10 hours. And also, pro tip, I didn't realize this. Every so often, the nurse would come in and tug on this thing. Like, pull on it. And then tape it to my thigh. So that there was, like, a constant tension. Which, duh, that makes sense. How else is it really going to, like, mechanically dilate your cervix? But one prepared for that. <laughs> So, and I also didn't know that when it came time to remove it, they just pull it out. Um, and the idea is that you've been, that your cervix is dilated enough for that to happen. So I would say early, early morning on Wednesday, I think it was like around 6 a.m., um, the doctor, no, not the doctor, the nurse came in and 
luckily I feel like I, I'm glad that I wasn't like fully awake because I had been sleeping and she came and she was like okay I need to pull it she had come like a little bit before that and tried to pull it out but it wasn't quite ready so she came in and pulled it out that hurt that was not comfortable I will say um and then she checked my cervix I was five centimeters so it was at that point that um we just it was decided to start the pitocin for the induction so we are at Wednesday morning um it was probably around I'd say eight in the morning sometime in the morning they started the pitocin and it took quite a while for me to start feeling the contractions and i will say you know the painful contractions that i was having when the mechanical dilator was in those had pretty much fizzled out um i think that thing was just made my uterus like really irritable but they did fizzle out after that so i went back to being fairly comfortable while i was having contractions i really don't have any frame of reference for when the contractions and the pitocin got painful but i know i i maxed out on the pitocin and then i feel like they turned it off for a little bit God, this is terrible. They turned it off for a little bit, turned it back on, took it back up. Um, suffice to say, at some point, it kicked me into labor. It was in very active labor. Um, they were, you know, luckily, they weren't super close together I mean they were my contractions I would say were every three to four minutes so not like every two minutes but they were very painful as you can imagine that they would be um and I used every resource available to me to try to manage these contractions because it was pretty it was pretty out of this world to be honest um and I labored for I don't really even though I, I feel like, you know, things got serious for me in the middle of the night on Thursday morning. So early, early Thursday morning. Um, and, you know, Chris was still there. My sister was there. My doula was there. Uh, we had a fairly, we were fairly certain that she was still posterior. So I was doing everything known to the world to try to get her to flip and turn and be in a good position to birth. Um, I was on my birthing ball. I was doing squatting. I was doing lunging. I was doing all kinds of uh, spinning babies techniques, which if you're not familiar with spinning babies, it is a website um, that is dedicated to spinning babies. <laughs> so like either getting babies from breech to vertex, which means head down, um, or just getting them in an optimal birthing position. Um, has tons and tons of really, really great resources and positions and you name it, I did it. <laughs> um, and it was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. So, um, she was very difficult to monitor while I was in labor because she was all over the place. I mean, you could just hear her, like they would put the monitors on, you could hear her kicking at the monitor, the heart rate monitor, kicking at the contraction monitor. She is flipping and flopping and turning and like just all over the place. So, um, and again, we knew that I had kind of a lot of fluid. So the concern was that like, there was so much fluid she just could not drop and engage into my pelvis so we decided uh to go ahead and let them uh break my water again this was at some point while i was on the pitocin I have no idea when um 
I want to say it was before I got uncomfortable. Um, so they broke my water and it was in fact true that I had a ton of fluid. I feel like the nurse was trying to keep it from like spilling over onto the floor. It definitely got on the doctor's pants, like so much fluid. But once they broke my water, her head was well applied to my cervix, which was good because she was still fairly high when they did it. One of the risks when they do that, um, and A, you have a ton of fluid, and B, the baby is still high, is that there can be a cord prolapse, meaning that the cord either rushes out of the cervix or the baby's head comes down, like the baby, the cord is between the baby's head and the cervix, which is an emergency situation. That's an emergency C-section. So um, they broke my water, her head came down and was nice and well applied to my cervix. Um, I think that that definitely kind of helped along the contractions, if I'm remembering accurately. Um, I was, and I knew I would be this way, I tried really hard not to be, but I was very preoccupied with the monitor. I really wanted her to be on the monitor so that we knew that like she was doing okay. And it was just, it was so hard to keep her heart rate on the monitor. You know, it's like I have all of these things that I need to be doing in terms of like my positioning to get her in a good position, but I was having to like hold the monitor on my belly because we just couldn't get like a good tracing. So after a while, I asked them to put an internal monitor on her, um, which they were fine with. You know, they were like, well, we're getting a pretty decent tracing. And I was like, that's because I'm holding this thing on. And I need to, I really just needed to try to like, let it go. It was like one less thing for me to worry about, you know, her being on the monitor. It was really distracting me from what I needed to be doing. So they put an internal monitor on her. If you're, if you haven't noticed, this has become quite an intervention heavy <laughs> induction. Which is just, you know, it's perfect in the end. Um, so we put an internal on her. I was maxed out on pit, really, really working through my contractions. I think I got to, I was around six or seven centimeters and just really was not progressing past that at this point it is now thursday um we're just gonna jump to like afternoon i am exhausted obviously and i have been laboring really really hard for a really long time and doing all of the crazy spinning babies positions that were so painful and uncomfortable and she just was like not turning. Um, I had been like six to seven centimeters for quite a long time. So <sighs> Thursday morning, it was around seven in the morning. Okay, this thought's coming back to me. I know somebody should have written all this shit down. Um, I decided like, just give me an epidural. I was, I was done. I was done. I was done. I was begging for an epidural at that point. So they came in and gave me an epidural, which was weird. It was so weird. Like I would, my hand would be on my leg. I'm like, what is that? Oh, that's my leg. Like I could not, obviously you can't feel anything. That's the whole point. Um, so I was definitely more comfortable um, for a while I was I was able to get a little sleep although they were in there flipping and flopping me every half an hour which is what you need to do you know you get the epidural like th the plan is not to just be like belly up in bed until you have your baby they need to be like turning you and because um, again she was not in a good position so we're doing all of the things I had the peanut ball between my legs to open up my hips and my pelvis, try to get her to turn. Um, but I was able to get a little bit of sleep. Um, I would say probably around noonish on Thursday, 
I was getting really uncomfortable. I was having a lot, like an incredible amount of back pain. Um, I felt like the epidural, I was like, is this thing working? I'm like hitting the button. And it was also, it had a continuous infusion on top of the bolus that I could do. Um, and it wasn't really making a difference. I noticed, I was like, oh look, I can move my legs now. <laughs> Which is a good indication that your epidural is not working. So it was probably mid afternoon, early evening that, because I, I had been dealing with it for a couple of hours, like just getting increasingly worse. For whatever reason, it hurts so bad to take a deep breath in, which, you know, when the contractions come on, like you're having to do a lot of like deep breathing. And it, it was just, I was just really uncomfortable. So we had the nurse anesthetist come in and take a look and the tubing had gotten kinked. So, minor detail. So he fixed that and I think he rebolused me as well and got me back to being comfortable. Um, at that point, I had been stuck at nine centimeters, that's right. So the doctor that came in, um, on Thursday morning, I think he started around 8 a.m. He checked me and I was like eight centimeters after, eight or nine centimeters after the epidural got placed. Um, and he checked my cervix and said I had some scar tissue in there, which I had a leap of my cervix uh, back when I was like 23 or so. Um, so that can definitely cause scar tissue, which can also prevent dilation. So he broke up that scar tissue with his fingers. And again, I was so glad I had that freaking epidural. <laughs> Cause you know, the thought of somebody breaking up scar tissue with their fingers does not sound great. Anyway, so he broke up that scar tissue, got to nine centimeters and I was nine centimeters pretty much all day. And he was just like, I don't understand. He was like, you have plenty of room. At one point, he actually yelled into my vagina, give me that baby. <laughs> Which sounds really, really weird and kind of off-putting. But in the moment, it was really funny because we were all just like exhausted and slap happy. Um, so, you know, by Thursday evening, probably around six, we had a heart to heart. And I was just like, you know, I feel like we need to start talking about if they are, you know, if it comes up that like, yeah, you know, you've been ruptured for 28 hours now. You're not really, you're stuck kind of like at nine centimeters. We start thinking about a C-section. I was like, we need to have that conversation. And when I say we, I mean like me and Chris and my sister and my doula. And I had decided that if it get, if it got brought up, that I was fine with that. Like, you know, at the end of the day, I knew in my heart that like, I had done everything I possibly could to get her to turn and come down so we could have a vaginal delivery. And it just wasn't happening. It just wasn't happening. And, you know, at that point, you have to start to wonder why? Why is she not coming down? My biggest concern the entire time was that, you know, I had so much amniotic fluid. She did so much flipping and turning from breech to vertex. I was concerned that she was tangled up in her cord somewhere. And she had had some, um, some dips in her heart rate at various points. Nothing like super bad. She did have a pretty decent D-cell um, at one point after I had my epidural, but it was again, because I was sitting up high, but she was having variables, which, you know, again, a, a lot of times can be a sign that there is like a cord pinched somewhere in there. So, you know, at that point I was just like, you know, I, I feel in my heart that there is a reason she's not coming down and that I was at peace 100% because I had done everything I possibly could. It had been a really, really long and drawn out process and I had handled it like a champion, but this is why C-sections exist, you know? So the doctor did come in and talk to us and he was like, you know, I think he was as frustrated as we were, you know? Um, and so we decided, yeah, let's just go ahead let's just go ahead and do it. Um, because my biggest fear 
was that we were going to continue on through the night and end up there by Friday morning anyway. You know, I had been ruptured for 28 hours. Um, they had started prophylactic antibiotics, which, you know, I never ran a fever or anything like that. Everything looked good with me. Everything looked good with baby. I did not want to get to a point where things didn't look good with me or baby. So we decided to move forward with the C-section. Once we decided that, shit got real. Everyone moved real fast. It was not emergent by <laughs> any stretch of the imagination, but... It was coming up on shift change and they wanted to get this shit done. <laughs> so they, um, luckily Chris was able to come back um, to the C-section with me. And she was born at 6.48 p.m. on Thursday, June 6th. And um, they uh, put up a clear surgical drape so that like I could see her being born and Chris could see her being born. Um, Chris took a picture. He was able to take some pictures of her right after she came out. They did do a little bit of delayed cord clamping for us, which I was really appreciative for. I thought that was really, really cool. Um, Chris announced that she was a girl, so that was really special. Um, so when she was born, they took her to the warmer just to kind of like do a quick little, you know, look at her. She came out, she was crying immediately she transitioned really really well and so i would say before she was five minutes old they brought her over and put her skin to skin with me um while the uh, doctors were uh, sewing up my incision and all of that which i thought was really really great as well so we got to do some skin to skin immediately and then once they sewed me up we went back to uh, my labor room, which actually functions as their recovery rooms, which I thought that was kind of cool. They didn't have like a separate recovery room. You just go back and recover in your labor room. Um, and I felt great. I felt so good. I will say that the nurse anesthetist dosed my epidural again, obviously for the C-section. And before they started, I realized I can't move my hands. Um, I was breathing just fine, but I was like, and I, I asked him, I was like, is it, is it normal for me to not be able to move my hands? That's kind of like how high they dosed me. Um, but I think because of that, I didn't feel shit. Like they will, they, they always tell you, you know, you're not going to feel pain, but you'll feel pressure. I didn't feel shit. Like I kept asking Chris, have they started? He's like, oh yeah, they're, they're well on their way. I felt no pressure. Usually once they have to like press on your belly to get the baby's head out of the incision. And that's usually a lot of pressure. I didn't feel shit. <laughs> Couldn't move my hands really. Um, but because of that, I felt really, really great. You know, I basically, I never had any nausea, which is something that can happen. Um, I felt great. So we get back to the room. Um, I pretty much, they set me up. I started eating ice chips and drinking water. Uh, did skin to skin with her. Uh, they let me do skin to skin for a good solid like hour or so. And I was trying to get her to latch and doing a little hand expressing of colostrum into her mouth before they did her blood sugars. And um, I will leave it. I'll kind of leave it at that because I'll talk about, I'll do a separate postpartum video. Um, but yeah, she's here. Uh, it took us maybe a day or so to, no, maybe like 12 hours to decide that her name was going to be Iris Elaine, which is, um, they're both actually family names on my mother's side. My maternal grandmother had a sister named Iris. And my maternal grandmother's middle name is Elaine and my sister's middle name is Elaine. So it was very, it's very special and she's perfect. She's perfect. Um, I've got several, not several, a couple of videos that I want to film again, filming about our postpartum experience in the hospital, but also our postpartum experience up until this point, it's been hard. Um, I'll be really honest, breastfeeding, has not gone well at all for us. We're still working at it, you know, but I would definitely like to film that at some point, which is, you know, these friggin' YouTube ladies that are doing this, 
like multiple times a week with like a newborn I don't know how they're doing it you know I was like oh maybe I'll do my hair put makeup on no this is this is my life now I'm perpetually covered in spit up probably or formula or whatever and I look like a hot mess but this is real life so um if you've hung in for the entire 35 plus minutes that this is going to be, I commend you. That is really impressive. Um, I am over on Instagram, uh, the lucky ones 81, I think. I have a link for it in my about section. Uh, so I post over there pictures of her, um, updates on how we're doing fairly regularly. So if you want to stay up to date, go over and follow me on Instagram. And, uh, you know, it's been a long time, <laughs> but um, we're just like so, so happy that she's here. And, you know, I knew in my heart the entire time that she was a girl, but it was really special to have that confirmed. I'm um, having a lot of fun with like the fun, like little girl clothes. <sighs> and we're just kind of soaking it in. I, I feel like on a daily basis, I look down and I'm like, oh, we have a baby. And she's ours. We're not like babysitting. She's here. But I hope everyone is doing well. I hope everyone has a really fun and safe, a safe uh, 4th of July. As I'm done with this video, I'm just now realizing that this camera is like cockeyed, so sorry about that it's not level whatever you'll forgive me i'm a postpartum mom so uh thanks for watching like and subscribe if you want and i will hopefully see you guys soonish all right bye